Welcome back to another episode at Economics Design. Today, we're still on the topic of stable coins. And in this series, I just want to share with you what are the different mechanisms to stable coins and how it is very important in this entire area of research because at the end of the day, how can we create a mechanism that's stable enough for us to use as the back-end mechanism to create this asset that can be used in our daily lives? So that's the general idea. And I've been sharing a lot of different kind of mechanisms. Today, I want to share another one of this project called Olympus DAO, OHM. And the interesting thing about this token is that it is not packed to one dollar. How? Let's find out. Again, disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice, everything is purely educational. We'll cover a few things today. What is OHM? How is the stable coin created? How do you maintain stability? What is this 3 comma 3 thing that everyone has in the ecosystem? Why is the prices quite high? And some opinions and thoughts to conclude. So, Lopez Dow, OHM, what is that? We have an episode to classify stable coins. Just check it out. And we look at them in four different categories. What's the mechanism? What is the peg? What is the collateral amount? And what is the collateral type? So, taking that into consideration, let's break OHM down. When it comes to mechanism, it uses the reserve and algorithmic mechanism. When it comes to the stablecoin, it is not pegged to anything, which is the special thing, which is why I want to tell you guys about this. It is partially collateralized and it uses on-chain collateral, which is DAO. So what is this mechanism? How do you have it both reserve and algorithmic? The reserve system uses DAI. So for every one OHM out there, part of it is backed by DAI. The other part is backed algorithmically. So the prices change algorithmically. It changes based on the amount of circulating supply of OHM. So it depends on how much tokens are being locked up, how much tokens are being used for exchange of transactions. So that's the general idea of how the mechanism is determined. So the reserve part, you can always change to increase or decrease. The algorithmic part is where it has a lot more creativity to create different kind of mechanisms, to change different kind of relationships to get that price. So add them together, that's the mechanism to create the stablecoin. The thing I want to talk about is the no pegged stablecoin. It is not pegged to $1, which is very interesting because in all these different stablecoins that we talked about, they are usually pegged to $1. You're pegged to $1 because you're testing out if the mechanism works or not. Then you can remove from the pack and you can peg to something else. Here, it behaves quite differently. It wants to be like a different Bitcoin where prices are not pegged and Bitcoin is used as a currency to be trading. Well, El Salvador knows that. So how do you create this stablecoin that it's not pegged to $1? and it allows the mechanism to still work. So the prices actually fluctuates just like the market. So the market determines how much it is and then it fluctuates based on that. It's quite similar to Bitcoin because no one controls that. You're just controlling the supply. The market determines the demand. There you get the price. Same way, this is something like that, but it's not fully like Bitcoin where it's completely market driven. Part of it is backed by DAI, which is the collateral. And lastly, we talk about the reserve. So it uses on-chain collaterals, which is DAI, and it uses partial reserve. Together, it creates this OHM token. So that means for every one OHM token that's circulating, a part of it is backed by DAI. It previously started with one DAI, today it's 16 DAI. So every one OHM token that's trading, there's 16 DAI that is backing that value. Which, if you think about it, it is the price floor for the token. So the token can't fall below that amount, otherwise people will arbitrage, people will sell OHM to get DAI back in the protocol. So that's the price floor. So how would you describe OHM then, Olympus DAO? If it's not a stable coin, what is that? My preferred term is a decentralized reserve currency. You know, so in the same way that people say that like Bitcoin will one day be uh, like reserve currency, uh, I think that that's the role that we are trying to fill. So, you know, something that you could use in all or like as an alternative to traditional fiat exhibiting similar characteristics right now you know we're definitely in more of an asset phase but the the goal is to actually transition to a currency which is something that you don't really hold to like speculate on the price of so how is the stable coin created it's created in three different steps very simple first you need to get the ohm token so you can get it either by the protocol so you buy it from the protocol itself or you get it in the open market so through sushi swap or through other dexes the second thing, what can you do with the OHM? Well, you can either stake it or bond it. Bonding just means you put it there and you are able to remove it in a shorter period of time. Staking means you have to keep it there for a longer period of time. In both cases, you're earning OHM tokens. And the last method is to sell. So that's how you exit the protocol. So there are three different behaviors here. You have staking, buying, bonding, and selling. So these are the three mechanisms. We'll talk about them a bit later. And let's dive a little bit back into the stability mechanism. Because when we talk about creating stable coins, the key to success, it's not about the price volatility, but about how it maintains that stability. That then will be shown in the price activities. So we want to understand what are the mechanisms in place so that it can create that stable value or stable asset. 
So there are four mechanisms over here. We have the treasury, we have the LP tokens, we have bonding, and we have stake. So part of this protocol, it's owned by the treasury. It's called a treasury controlled value. So the treasury will control part of these values to do any internal arbitrage to maintain that price for OHM tokens. Second thing is LP tokens. So other than using your OHM tokens for bonding and staking, you can deposit them together with DAI into a DAI OHM pool on SushiSwap. With the LP tokens, you can sell it to the treasury who will be managing all of that. Thirdly, you can bond the system. So you can buy OHM tokens from the protocol and you bond it. And fourthly is to stake. Stake is for a longer period of time. Bond is more active management. Staking is passive management because you're just getting OHM and then putting it there to remove the supply out of the market and to earn some OHM tokens when you're staking. From what I understand, the mechanism, because it's an ergo asset, so it rebases, it does a lot of different mechanisms to get that balance. And there are four main mechanisms that you have in Olympus DAO. There's treasury, there is a liquidity pool, there is bonding, and then there's staking. So can you run through what these different mechanisms are? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'll start with the, the treasury. So basically the treasury is what houses our assets. You know, so we have this mint requirement, which is that we cannot mint ohm unless we have at least one die to back it. The way that we access that backing is by the bond market. So the way that the bonds work is they're like a derivative market of ohm. They don't trade at the same price and they don't use oracles or anything to determine their price. Um, it's basically when people buy bonds, the price of a bond will go up. When they redeem their bonds, the price of the bond will go down. And then market participants decide based on their actions, uh, you know, where those trade. Those serve to bring in new assets. So when you buy a bond, you're buying from the treasury directly. Um, you know, that capital goes into the treasury. Um, it pays you out. And, you know, that serves to, one, bringing new backing for the ohm that, you know, is given to you. But it also brings in some level of profit. That profit is used to mint new ohm, which gets distributed to stakers and they're incentivized to come into staking, bring supply off the market and then keep it off the market in staking. They're pretty heavily incentivized to, to do so. Um, we also accumulate shares of the liquidity pool, you know, so we want to have like a robust trading pool and trading environment. And so the treasury will actually buy LP shares from market participants and then lock them off the market. You know, a, a big reason for that was having witnessed both Ample Forth and ESD, where both of them were actually preceded, like the end was preceded by most of their liquidity getting pulled out because it was all external liquidity. Those LPs kind of saw it coming before anyone else. They they pulled their liquidity and then, you know, suddenly you got everyone dashing for the door and, you know, no exit. So we accumulate and hold pretty much our entire pool. And that kind of ensures that no matter what happens, there will be a pool for people to trade in. And I think that that does a lot for, you know, confidence and belief in like long term viability that, you know, you're not just going to have the rug pulled on you. <laughs> so to summarize, there are four different mechanisms. The first one is treasury. So it's kind of like protocol controlled treasury. And this treasury will do arbitrage because it's backed by one die. So if die increases or decreases, then you will either buy or sell own tokens. And that's one of the places where you get profits. Yeah, correct. The second one is liquidity. So that's where you mentioned that you lock up LP tokens. So people are staking Ohm and DAI in SushiSwap and you're staking the LP tokens as part of your liquidity. Is that right? So they will add liquidity and then they'll sell that liquidity to the treasury. The The treasury actually stakes some of it nonsense, um, but for the most part, it just kind of sits there accruing some fees, but mostly just providing liquidity to the market. So it's not like a stake dynamic where they can take it back. It's actually owned by the treasury. So the treasury does arbitrage between OMP and DAI, number one. The treasury also stakes in liquidity pools of like SushiSwap and whatever to get profits. And that's how you ensure that there is enough liquidity that is governed by the protocol. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. And the third one is a bond mechanism in which people can purchase or they can receive OMP from buying into the bond system. Yeah, so it's a secondary market to trade with the protocol itself. So you can buy and sell these bond tokens. Is there a different token? Uh, no, so it's actually not a different token. Um, they're pretty much, uh, while we are above backing, they're, they're one way on the buy side. So the protocol will be the, the counterparty on the sell side for you. And it'll generally provide you with, you know, some discount if you time it right. Oh, okay. And the last mechanism is staking rewards. So this staking rewards, how is it different from liquidity? So in the case of staking, the incentive is to bring supply out of the pool and out of the market and, you know, kind of lock them up on the sidelines. 
So, you know, it, it's different in that it's single asset staking. It's the, the primary recipient of the profits of the network. Okay, so the staking is within the platform, whereas liquidity is using a secondary party, which are DEXs available. That's the difference, right? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, got it. So we also talked about how there is bonding and there's staking. They're quite similar, but they're different. So let Zeus explain what the difference is. Let me just summarize what we've talked about so far. So there's staking and there's bonding. Both of them are where you put your own as your assets, keep it in the protocol, and the protocol will give you returns. With staking, it will give you additional OM. With bonding, you give, they give you additional OM. With staking, you can put for as long as you want, doesn't matter. And you will just keep getting additional tokens three times a day. Whereas for bond, you put them for five days and you can either realize that returns or you can continue bonding for the next five days and five days and five days. And that's the main difference. So why is there different returns coming in? Why are you getting more OM tokens? It's because you're providing work, you're providing value to the protocol by staking your assets, your OM tokens in a protocol. This is adding liquidity to the protocol, kind of like value add to the protocol. And hence you're rewarded for that. Pretty spot on. We do kind of see that, you know, bonds are generally more profitable um, if you really play them correctly. Um, and they kind of should be because they're more of a direct value accrual. Kind of the difference is that bonds are an active strategy and they're much less consistent. Um, you don't kind of know when you're going to get what discount um, or if you will. Um, and then you have staking, which is, you know, more of a passive strategy where you, you know, experience the growth of the network. Um, you know, the purpose of incentivizing the staking is the same as in the case of Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, you know, they don't have staking, but it's similar on the protocol level to sustain the bonds for Bitcoin. You know, there's 30 million dollars worth of Bitcoin mined every day and you need someone to be the counterpart of the miner, you know, selling that Bitcoin to cover their costs. In, in the case of staking, it's similar. The, the rewards primarily serve to hedge the staker against dilution, um, where if we were to have no rewards, then you would just have only the bonds increasing supply and stakers would be losing market share. And that would make a, a pretty hard sell for why you would want to hold OM itself. In our case, you pretty closely track the growth of the network at large. And so you, you can experience the growth of the network despite the fact that supply is increasing around you. Next, we'll talk about this 3,3 thing. You realize that everyone in the ecosystem has this 3,3 in all their social media handles. What does it mean and what is that? Remember what we talked about before, where there are three behaviors that you can act in the system or you can display in the system. You can do staking, bonding, and selling. So these are three different activities, three different behaviors. Remember, in economics, it's all about behaviors. We want to understand what kind of behaviors are there in the system. Then we can incentivize or disincentivize any of these behaviors. So as you can imagine, we have staking and bonding. That's good because there's people buying the tokens, there's using the tokens, there's keeping the tokens. And then selling is a not so good one where people are selling it and increases the token circulating, which can decrease the price. So based on these three different things, what do we want to incentivize and what do we want to disincentivize? We want to incentivize the staking and bonding because there's people using the tokens, there's people demanding the tokens. And we want to disincentivize selling because that's people not demanding the tokens. And we don't want that. We want to increase the demand of the tokens. That's how the tokens have different kind of value. So in that system, then we give points to them because we can also rank them based on plus and minus points. So staking is the best because staking is taking the supply out for a longer period of time and it's a passive income for people. So that's plus three points because that's very good. Bonding is also good because it's people taking some tokens out and people trading, actively trading to do different kind of arbitrage in the secondary market. That's also good. It's not as good, but it's still good. So give it plus one point. And the last one is selling. You don't want people to sell because it means people are demanding less of it. So it's minus one point. So with that, we have three points plus one point and minus one point. Based on that, if you map it out in a game theory kind of way, the best hope that you want people to do, the best behaviors you want, the best outcomes that you want, is that it's 3-3. Three, three. That means everyone would be staking. As long as you're staking, it's three points. So if everyone is staking, it's 3-3. Three, three. So that's the general idea of what 3-3 three, three is. So what is the utility of the OHM token? So when people are adding OM into the system, are you using this OM, this liquidity for the protocol, to be doing anything? Or is it just staying there? Um, so it pretty much just stays there. You know, we're we're working on integrations to add utility to it itself. So we're we're going to get on some money markets, enable the ability to to borrow against some other cool things that we would like to do. 
But, you know, it, it carries a similar utility that Bitcoin holders do, which is mostly to remove supply from the market or develop an internal circular economy around the token itself. Because, you know, that's the end goal is that we want to minimize the need to on-ramp or off-ramp, um, you know, as much as possible. Build up an independent economy where, you know, you can hold home and use it for whatever you want to without actually having to off-ramp into another currency. Now let's compare OHM with Bitcoin, because as Zeus was saying, OHM is not going to be one of the stable coins to compete with USDC or USDT or DAI. OHM will be a token that is going to be an alternative to Bitcoin. And how is it different? How is it the same? So let's hear from him. Let me just ask one last question, because you touched on it a little bit just now, where prices are now quite high. And I know that every OMP right now is backed by 16 DAI. So that's the lower bound of this entire thing. So how do you, how are you going to deal with prices being so high now? When you want to use this for transaction, you can't have a, a number that's so high. It's better to have every token to be worth, I don't know, one or two dollars. Then it's easier to be transacting. Otherwise, it's transacting 0.000 OMP. I see it as kind of that decrease will occur as we grow over time. Um, you know, so right now we don't really need that like ability, I think, to to be quoting goods in ohm terms. Even if we had the ability, there wouldn't really be any quoting to be done. It's actually similar to, you know, what, what the dollar has done, where, you know, the dollar was once worth 100 plus times what it is today. And over the course of the last 100 years, it has depreciated as the USD network has grown. I would expect kind of a similar dynamic where, you know, you have this constantly deprecating currency that, you know, is losing value as the network itself gains value. I think that it will decrease and converge to lower numbers as we grow. Basically, like that one dollar point is our floor. You know, that, that should be kind of hit when there's no more growth to be had on the network side. I don't think that we're anywhere near that point today. And so there's no reason that we should actually be like down that close to it. The price floor for Bitcoin is zero dollars. The price floor for OMP is one dollar. So what's the point of trading Bitcoin or OMP at such a premium? Why is it trading at a premium? We know they will not go below that price floor of zero dollars, one dollar or the cost to mine it. But what defines that premium that it's trading above that? Where's the premium coming from? It's kind of the, the value production of the network. To me, it's the question of why does anything trade above zero? Well, there are two types of value in the system, right? You have the intrinsic value and the extrinsic value. The intrinsic value is the utility value within your ecosystem. So Bitcoin is used within the ecosystem to be paying for transaction fees when you're executing or you're transferring Bitcoins. There is this like small but a good amount of utility value, whereas the extrinsic value is the exchange value how the market perceives it, how do you use this to exchange for another good and services. So these two together, you add them up to get the price of an asset. So you have the intrinsic value plus the extrinsic value, just you can call it premium or whatever to get the market price. So that's usually how things are being priced, right? Yeah, so I would say our intrinsic value is, you know, capital based, you know, the intrinsic value of a, you know, transactional network is generally like fee based, like you're saying. Um, and then you have, you know, what's generally a speculative premium on top of that, which in the case of both the speculative premium enables the the increase in the intrinsic value of the network, where, you know, the higher that speculative premium is, um, you know, if we use mining, you know, the higher that premium is, the higher the fees paid are, which means that there's more capacity for more miners, which can increase the, you know, intrinsic value the network um which kind of has a recursive cycle to the upside um but you know it does start with you know the fact that there's just like a speculative premium placed on top of intrinsic value especially when a lot of systems are new there's quite a lot of premium in the extrinsic value and that definitely makes sense that usually works for a lot of brand new ecosystems and protocols so now that we understood what ohm is what the mechanism is let's go through some thoughts and opinions about it so firstly, it is a very new concept, okay? And I think that's great to experiment and find different ways to create different kind of stable mechanisms. Right now, it wants to be a Bitcoin and it classifies itself as a reserve asset instead, which is good. However, when we want to talk about stable coins, when we're talking about to create stable mechanisms, the first step is to peg it to something that doesn't change. And then we're going to test our system out. We're going to test our stability mechanism. Then when our stability mechanism is proven, step two is to unpeg it and then allow the price to float a bit, allow the prices to fluctuate. And then your stability mechanism will allow this asset to be a very healthy form of currency to be trading. Right now, it doesn't do the pack part, so we can't really test the robustness, we can't really test how well the prices are behaving, and we can't really test if the token policy is robust enough or not. So that's something to consider. The other thing is, I like that they use the game theory mechanism to explain what 3.3 is. So game theory is really a display of what are the different possible strategies and what are the different possible outcomes if different people behave differently. 
And that grid of the 3, 3, 3, 1, 1, 3, minus 1, minus 1, all these numbers, they're just possible outcomes based on different strategies. So imagine if you go to war, you on this side, your enemy on this side, how you guys behave, how you guys fight. This is now a possibility of outcomes. What you want to do as a war person or game theorist is to figure out not which strategy is the best out of the outcomes, but which strategy is most likely based on your perception of what the other person is doing. So that's what game theorists do. The game theorists or economists are not just creating these different brackets and boxes and tables to write the numbers down. There's a lot of analysis going on and the goal is to create mechanisms to make the best outcome. So let's say in this situation, the best outcome is 3-3. Three, three. What we're doing as economists is to design mechanisms to make sure that people will always choose three. No matter what other people are doing, I will always want to choose three. So, because this is just the first part of the analysis, the next step to this analysis is to create very robust mechanism to make sure that it is a dominant strategy, it is binding strategy for people to want to stake. Right now, that's not the case. So you can't say that 3-3 is a binding or dominant strategy because that's not how game theory works or the game theory analysis works. What you want to do is to understand these are the possible outcomes. There is one specific strategy that I'm interested in. I want people to behave in this way. Then what kind of incentives can we do? What kind of mechanisms can we design? What kind of incentive mechanisms can we create? Can we build as parameters to make people choose that, to incentivize them towards that behavior? And that is really what economics design is about. That's really what goes through the head of protocol designers when we're looking at analyzing these game theory aspects. Because having a table is great. Having a table gives us the game plan of what could happen. And what we can do then as the next step is to design strategies around this game plan to make sure that one of these strategies becomes the strongest dominant compatible strategy against all other possible actions. So that's what we're trying to do. With that, I hope that gives you some insights to Olympus DAO and what OHM is doing. If you're interested in more things like that, we wrote about that in the Token Economics book. It is a handbook that's very handy for you to understand how to build a protocol, how to analyze protocols. And we also are on Discord, we're on Twitter. If you want to have more analysis on all these different stuff, how do you analyze, how do you measure these matrix, how do you measure how robust the design is, go check out Econteric. So it's like esoteric, but for economics. Check out econteric.com. We're going to publish more reports and publish more insights over there. Till then, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!